Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well over here. I'm excited for the format of today's episode. I know we have uh, something a bit different going on uh, with the interview, but I want to ask, how are you doing over there? Uh, yeah, no, I'm excited about this, uh, this little switcheroony here. I, uh, uh, I was, I was able to, uh, to grab an interview with, uh, with one of my buddies. So, so I will introduce that, uh, in, a in a while. Uh, but first we have a, uh, a couple of, of articles, uh, specifically about, uh, open source and how it's awesome and stuff. So <laughs> I, I that wanted we to, do. to lead off with, with Dan Brown's post here. Um, and I actually thought he had gone over this before, but uh, you know, it's, it's just a really well laid out thesis uh, as to how one contributes in to an open source project. Yeah, I agree. And really, I think he did post something similar to this that we covered a few months back. But the one thing I wanted to bring up, which I really liked, uh, was the way he described uh, the different requests. So, you know, filing a bug report, this is a bug. Uh, Filing feature requests or filing like a support request. But what I really liked is the way he requests users to request these feature, put in feature requests. He basically says... Uh, instead of making it super technical, for example, requesting, quote, add a header to add a header bar link to page X, end quote, instead of uh, provide faster access to page X from any location since this would benefit Y. And I think a lot of us get hung up on the technical side with the technical jargon, you know, just add a header, add all the links versus, OK, we're adding this, but why, what's the benefit of it? What is the benefit of it? And so mm-hmm. I really liked he kind of brought that out that was one of the minor things he brought up but overall the post just kind of goes into how to contribute where to contribute where to start contributing well and that's the benefit of a plugin type system right specifically because then you don't have to necessarily wait for you know the core individuals to get through all the rest of their day-to-day and then then come back to something right it's it's uh it's the whole batteries included you know makes makes a a item very heavy and uh you know, not just heavy as as far as like it's a large package to download but you know it's it's a lot of overhead a lot of maintenance a lot of this and a lot of that but uh with with Linus's law um with many eyes all bugs are shallow right which is kind of the flip side of that that benefit to open source um and project zero um of google google's project zero uh recently kind of put that into numbers which was pretty cool to see Uh, so they went through uh different bugs uh that they had found um since uh january 2019 and tracked them per vendor so tracked apple microsoft Google, Linux, Adobe, Mozilla, Samsung, Oracle, and others, and said, you know, how many bugs? Um, uh, and and this is like vulnerability. These are like like how many how many critical vulnerabilities, right? Um, specifically bugs, but like you know these these things that could be exploited. You know when when were they fixed? Um, were they fixed during the grace period or did they exceed their their deadline and uh and how how long did it take to fix and if you go through the companies that i listed off there the only open source ones are linux and mozilla and i don't i don't even know if mozilla is open source pocket yet but um like linux itself is going to be the only truly open source uh project there uh, and actually, it got the best number. So it got the best uh, fixed by day 90 percentage at 96%, although barely nudging Google out. And Google had 95%. Um, they also had um, one that was fixed during the extended 
uh, grace ex, uh, or during the grace period, all right, that they gave it, or, or that exceeded the deadline in, in the grace period. Um, out of the 25 that were reported, 24 of those got the fix. Uh, and it took them an average of 25 days to fix. The next runner up, I believe, is 44. So, like, by a large margin, um, they were the fastest to fix bugs. So not only did they have the most bugs fixed, but they were the fastest to fix them. Um, so, so that, and yes, that is specifically, I believe, for the kernel, for the Linux kernel, like the Linux project. Um, but still, that is kind of proof in the numbers of how reliable open source can be. Now, it's not a magic bullet, right? It's it's not something that you can just sprinkle on any project and automatically you get security. Security. And, <laughs> and as, as much I'm as... I'm glad we were thinking yeah. along the same lines with that yeah. one. You, you, you can't just say, well, we're running on Linux. Why? <laughs> this should be secure. Yeah. Well, you yeah. can't just open everything and say you're secure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> everything is open source, therefore secure. Uh, that's not how that works. But uh, doing it intelligently, doing it correctly, doing it, building a community, building trust, you know, building that, that understanding and expectation does pay off. Uh, so it was really cool to see numbers be put behind that because you and I both know that. Uh, but yeah, being able to to say here's the proof, here's where it comes in full force. Here, here's where we can really see it paint out. It is 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 great to be able to have in in my back pocket. I found the uh, all these numbers very interesting, especially because of that grace period. I didn't realize that was a seven day mm -hmm. fix it in seven days, and that's your grace period before we disclose this. Mm -hmm. And it's just weird to see how many of these were not fixed during that grace period and resolved within ninety days. I mean, ninety days is three months. That's a lot of time mm -hmm. if you think about it. Mm -hmm. That is a, what a, a quarter? Mm -hmm. No, not a quarter. Almost a quarter of the year, right? Yeah, uh, that's that's a quarter. Yeah, ninety pretty, days. Pretty yeah. close. Yeah, pretty close. But, um, really, just if you think about <laughs> the, those types of bugs, I don't know if they were all zero days, but if you think of these types of bugs just being out there, I mean, ninety days is just a ton of time to exploit. So, really good to see the numbers were really low for Linux, and I think it just kind of goes to show and prove that you know what is it linus's law the more eyes on it the less it's going to be the more eyes on it the more secure it's going to be i think it's, it's something along those lines yes something along those <laughs> with lines many, with many with many eyes e e exactly <laughs> along those lines yes <laughs> but i think speaking of open source projects uh i we do have a few community and news updates around the projects we host and support um and I'm not going to, again, I've just kind of started to skim through these, go over these. Uh, if you really want to see more, they're in the show notes, but uh, I'll just cover the brief highlights here. Uh, WordPress moved to 5.9, which is Josephine. Uh, Sweet CRM 7.12.4 was released. Nextcloud 23.0.2, 22.2.5, and 21.0.9 is released. Uh, Canboard has another release out there. Firefly 3 has another release out there. And then this one kind of threw me off, Dollar Bar. Uh, version 15 was released. So I think the last episode, two weeks ago, I had discussed how their version 15 alpha was being delayed, but they have since decided that it is released now. So I don't know if it took them two weeks to just turn around an alpha into a final baked product, but uh, nonetheless, version 15 is released. And that is all I have for news and community updates. Uh, I know we have some of our own developments. Um, if you want to talk on those, some of those. Yes, as far as our composed developments, uh, just a lot of bug fixes here, mainly. Um, one, I, I believe I mentioned last episode, uh, where journal logs weren't shown up in the uh, Ubuntu uh, OS, um, which also caused deploys to fail because of cloud in it, right? So those those are kind of together. So we, I, you know, a simple restart of, of the system D journal D daemon fixes that so that's it that's it easy enough you know when we spin up a new vm just kick the service uh kick 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 the demon um 
But then in doing research, I also found that cloud init has its own command. So we don't have to parse the journal logs to see if it finished for, you know, like a specific text string or whatever. Uh, it does have a wait command. Uh, so, so cloud init, I think it's cloud init status wait. Um, and that will wait for cloud init to be done. And then once it's done, it exits zero or exits non zero. Nice. So I'm like, that's super handy. So we really were really nice. Yeah, I was, <laughs> was able to use that. Uh, it looks a whole lot better, uh, in, in an Ansible playbook. You know, I'm not, you know, parsing the journal and grepping and the, sure. It, it, it looks nice. It, it, it's, it's very clean. So I like that. Uh, the other bug fix I had, uh, it were that logical backups were being deleted all but one of them from my sequel. And this is, this was just the case of bash scripting, trying to get too smart for my own good. Um, cause when I, when I do a for loop, I did a for loop over, uh, dot slash asterisk, which is every file in the the directory. Right? Directory, yeah. However, that makes i, right, the, the, the loop variable, that makes i be dot slash file name, right? And the conditional I had to delete it is, you know, if the file name was, had a date that was older than the one I, I set being the cutoff, which is like 90 days. Which is all well and good until you take into account that the dot slash prepended to the file name in the loop variable meant that it was always marked as older than because the file name <laughs> itself it was came before the yeah so alphanumerically so it, it ended up treating all the files as old backups and, and getting rid of them. So uh, instead of doing that, um, there was actually some bash magic you can do where you can strip out a prefix to a variable as you use the variable itself. So you you do like a dollar sign curly brace, I being the variable in this case, and then um, uh, pound sign, pound sign, the prefix that you want to strip from it and then cur close, close the curly brace. So, so I was able to strip the dot slash from, from there. I, I like iterating yeah. over that dot slash because it does give me a, this is actually everything inside of this directory. I'm not just globbing everything. I'm, I'm specifically saying that this is going to be a, a path here and um, it just makes more sense, especially when I'm reading it too. It makes it a little bit more readable, but doesn't help if it's readable if it bites you in the butt because it's still biting you in the butt. So so that that got fixed, that got updated. Uh, that was cool. That was one of those bash trips tricks that you just like pick up along the way. And you know, I was I was I was actually having a hard time recalling it because I know that if you do a percentage sign, that's get rid of the suffix. Um, but I I had forgotten what the prefix was. So that bringing back that hash uh, really really helped me. Uh, and then lastly here we have uh, stable 4.1 is released. Now that is a misnomer because it's not entirely stable right now. Uh, the collection part of it is stable. Uh, what we're working towards is the portal side of it. Um, yeah. With the feature parity and the stability parity. I want to call it stability parity. How, do, how does that sound? The parity of stability. And once we have that in, I'll probably bump it to, to stable 4.2. Now it is it is functional. Uh, I've, I've been doing deploys. I've been doing testing with different scripts and, and functions and even migrations. Um, actually, I found uh, several things that needed updating when I went to do a migration, but uh, I was able to, to finally successfully kick one off. And it uh, works works like a dream. Uh, honestly, there's there's been a lot of efficiencies added. And it, it it really does go very smoothly. I was going to say, uh, the one thing to add with Stable 4.1, uh, we have a, one huge commit. <laughs> uh, well, I should say multiple commits for Portal. Uh, one PR, I should say, mm. for mm -hmm. Stable 4.0 to get that feature parity uh, to match the collection and the Play Branch version. So... They're they're coming in, they're in the pipeline yeah. they're coming down yes, the they pipeline are. is they are. what yes. I'm gonna say yes uh, and 
we we can still, however, go over the the services that we offer. You know, as we typically do on the podcast. Uh, Jack today is going to finish us up with uh, with Firefly 3's application interface. Um, so he's going to cover everything that I neglected to cover on the last so, episode. Really, there. <laughs> And thank you for the intro. Really, there are only a handful of things to report on with uh, the application interface discussing the others category, per se. Uh, With it, you have uh, accounts, classifications, reports, exporting data, your options. um, And really, that's it right there. So, obviously, uh, just a real quick run through. I'm not going to go into deep detail on all the accounts and everything. I think we discussed on that for the most part, uh, two episodes ago. Um, Basically, you have asset accounts, expense accounts, revenue accounts, liabilities. And really, these are just kind of easy. I'm not going to go into detail again on these. Uh, They're there. This is how you basically create them. This is how you create all those different accounts. Um, Then you get into classifications, which I found very interesting, uh, which discusses categories and tags right and i think you and i have very good understanding of what this is uh within can board now when it comes to expenses what do these look like right and that's what i always ask myself what's a category versus what's it what do i tag something um so a category would be like shopping or lifestyle is what i think of Um, why it's broad right i I keep the categories i think of as more broad right uh i would say I would say more like lifestyle, basically, uh, would be the broader category. And then the tag might be shopping related or, you know, cosmetic. We, we can go down this uh, example, sure. uh, like do, a cosmetic tag. Do I but, do I necessarily need uh, any kind of transaction slash account slash wherever else these categories would be like a piggy bank, wherever else these categories would be applied? Do I need all of them to fit in one of the categories that I come up with? No. Okay. No, they they're option very much optional. Okay. They do not have to be. You do not have to categorize anything. You do not have to tag anything. It's there for your own sake to sort and look at for your own sake what you want to do. Um, I asked myself the same thing, so I went through and I created a bunch of random transactions, a random bunch of random accounts, and you can categorize the transactions however you want. You don't have to add them now it is worth noting with categories the category has to exist before you can categorize it if that makes sense so you have to have the category there whereas tags are pretty arbitrary tags you can type in you can tag a transaction and just type in whatever tag you want and it will just kind of add it in and it's just like oh i'm gonna tag this as close why because i feel like it because it makes sense and then you're able to track it through that uh so those that that is the two the one I guess major thing to note, categories are mandatory beforehand, tags just kind of when you're entering the transaction. I found especially a lot of those ones that get created on the fly, so so tags in this instance, um, some pieces of software call them labels. Uh, when, when you have that field that gets populated as you type it in, uh, those come in super handy, I found, almost as a rule of thumb, with with temporary ways to organize things for example uh, having everything tagged as q1 2022 right um because that is a temporary tag that you're going to use for a while and then you're just gonna it, it doesn't matter that it's on there anymore if you you know, if you were to delete all of them, it's probably not going to matter. Whereas if you right. wanted to create a category, each time a, a cycle came back around, you would end you up can, with just a ton of categories that wouldn't make any sense. And they'd be all hanging around. And like when you're doing reporting, you'd have a bunch of zeros because they're all like. It's just not. Yeah, right. yeah. It's just a bunch of random stuff. Like, right. like for instance, um, and I actually just re situated my own personal board um and i did something that i think i talked about previously uh on the podcast uh, the way i set up my financial uh just way of thinking about how i do expenses is that i set it up according to maslow's hierarchy of needs right uh so i have like 
physiological at the top uh, and then safety and es- belonging and esteem and self-actualization. So like the most important thing is going to be at the, at the top, like getting groceries or, you know, yeah. clothes. Uh, but sometimes clothes are in esteem because they're like nice clothes. They're not like necessary clothes. So trying to figure that out and, and then, you know, having clothes as a, a, a tag, right? So my category is necessarily being one of those uh, and, and then having a, a tag or, or different, different way of, of denoting the other thing besides the category, which should be kind of applicable across the board. Sure. Uh, I, I like that. How you do that. Uh, your Maslow's hierarchy of it needs. Works. And then you I'm can, telling and you, then it you works. Can, and then that's, that's a good way to categorize everything, right? You can decide how you want to categorize each purchase and mm-hmm. then you can tag it however you need to tag it. So you're right. You can go out and get food. Is it a nice meal or is it just something to sustain you? Chicken right? and broccoli. And that, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I, I like that. That's a good, uh, good example. A good way to think about that. Those kinds of, a good way to categorize those types of purchases. Uh, so again, not to harp on this, but these are all optional, right? Anytime you create a transaction, you do not have to tag a category. You do not have to tag a, you not you don't have to add a tag. So both optional. Uh, if you look at the documentation, I have a terrible tag in there. Um, <laughs> the transaction I created was a work transaction, just a random, you know, random number. Where is it source to the car payment? Uh, the description's terrible, but the, I, I'm going to have to go through and update it. The tag is payment. <laughs> so terrible because it's already a transaction. Yeah, but don't, don't try this at home. Get that kids. updated. Yeah. <laughs> um, next with the application interface, the other, other types of things that are available is reports. Mm. And this one's huge. Mm. I really like this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, because who doesn't like graphs, charts, and visual aids? Hey, to look I, at yeah, how I know spending people their money. in my day job who their entire day is filled with graphs and charts. They love it. Do they love it? Yeah. This is this is uh helps visual visualizing it. Sure. Um, so with creating report types, there are five or six here that you can create. Uh, default financial report, transaction history, overview. Uh, You can create a budget, you can create a category report, you can create that tag report, and then you can create expense and revenue account reports. Uh, The really nice thing with this, so you can, you can specify what accounts you want to include and what you want to exclude. So if you really want to just say, all right, what do I want to see? How much do I, how much did I spend? (laughs) You can specifically show Mm -hmm. your, uh, you know, your expense accounts, essentially. Uh, Along with that, you get the date range. For anyone importing data that's over 20 years old, I have some bad news for you. Uh, reports only go back 20 years, um, but they are, uh, they can be as short as a week, I believe. And then uh, the default, I think, is set to a month. So I, I've had to play around with it because uh, I, a year is usually what I find helpful just to categorize where trends, what do they look like. Um, did, I, did I tell you that my parents are moving out of their house? You had mentioned it. Yeah, you had mentioned it. So they're doing that, and for just to preface this, I mean, my mom's not a hoarder by any by any means, um, but she does love. Let's say has a tendency to uh, save a lot of documents, just because it's easy. I mean, you throw it in a box, sure. you throw it in the basement, and you you sure. you keep it down there until you don't need it anymore. Well. She decided she didn't need a lot of those things anymore. And then going through that, uh, which, you know, kind of, I, I remember because of your 20 year comment, uh, she had found bank statements and, and credit card statements going back to 1982. My, okay. Yeah. yeah That's and, and, crazy. And it's not like, it's okay. not like, you know. There was one or two of them in 1982. Like it was history like a started years, a year's at 1982. <laughs> a year's worth, yeah, and, a year's and worth of transactions continued on to present day. Uh, <laughs> so that was that was kind of funny to to hear, and you know, and on reflection of that, yeah, it's probably not going to be helpful. You know, it, it's and, and and that's the frustrating part. It's like I have this information, I have this data. Isn't data supposed to be useful? And it's like no. Not all data is the same. Yeah. 
behind a certain point, unfortunately, no. I mean, I, I highly see it unlikely for you to get audited that long. What, what, what are we coming up? That's almost 40 years, yes. right? Yes. That is almost 40 years ago. Yeah. I, I highly doubt someone's going to come and say, hey, what were you doing in 1982, by the yeah. way? But she has them if she needs them. But, well, um, not anymore. Because they've been, <laughs> oh, no. They've got been, rid of them. They've been <laughs> shredded. Yeah. No, and, and, and I guess that's that's the... The end of that, it's like, look, what? Why are you doing this, right? And we go back to what we discussed earlier today. It's like, why am I creating a header, right? Why am I? Why am I saving this paper? There's always going to be a reason for things. And if you don't solve a problem, if you if you don't define that why, if you don't have that you know, motivation, that 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 drive to do something right. It just becomes another meaningless, you know, and, and do I even have to do this kind of a task? Right. And, and then, then you don't get excited about like digging into these kind of reports because these reports don't tell you anything. Right. Right. The one I really liked, I'll tell you was the audit report that they have available. It's a super interesting one. It's supposed to give you an exact overview of your asset account, basically just tracking what hap what's happening to every asset, right? What what are, what are all the transactions? Where is my money actually going? So that's the one thing I really liked uh, when I saw this. But these reports are meant for you to look at, right? They're not meant... You can enter in all the transactions you want into Firefly 3. But I mean, in, in on the front page, it does give you like a, hey, this is where your net balances are. But I think you have to go back and look and say, where is everything? And what is it, where has it been going? Because if you don't have a handle on that, you're, you have to know where you are to, for where you want to go. And I think that is really where reports come in. So uh, the four of these are very beneficial. They're highly customizable in the sense that you get to choose what accounts are going where. You know, you can track just your asset account just what's your bank account doing you can track just what where are my expenses what are the expenses looking like um or you can put them all together and just kind of track and manage what where everything's going uh and that you know obviously that overview of everything is going to be the most beneficial but if you need to drill down you have the ability to uh on top of reports uh there are there uh, this it feels very miscellaneous uh, this episode, there's just a, lo a lot of high level stuff to cover. Um, but there are a couple features I found in the options section that I found very interesting. Um, a lot of these are just your standard options uh, when you sign into an account. So basically, user ID, all that information, command, you can, you can operate this from the command line for a command line token, you can do OAuth. I found they have a two factor authentication if you want to get pretty deep into it it's very cool it's just out of the box right usually with these two-factor authentications unfortunately what i've seen with some of these applications is it ends up being you have to implement a third-party provider like authy or you know whoever uh set up some kind of text relay and at that point you say all right well the technical burden of this is just i don't want to do this with theirs it's very simple. It's out of the box. So you, I don't have a picture of it, but you can click on the two-step verification link in your profile. It shows a QR code and then it shows the, uh, if you want to do it manually, it shows the recovery codes, I believe. I don't know. I don't think they're recovery codes, but it shows basically the uh, eight characters. And I think there's 64 of them that you can add into, say, your Bitwarden instance. And then from there, it generates a code uh, in Bitwarden. You take that code and you you put it in your two-step verification, and then it asks you for a second code once it's generated. Uh, and so this one really stood out to me because I, I don't see that very often on these types of applications. Usually it's forcing you to roll your own. So uh, pretty cool to see that one. Um, and then the other one, obviously, if you just are absolutely done with Firefly, you have the option to delete all data. <laughs> you can delete it's a weird one uh, whatever you want kind of it's it's not just a delete all it's like a delete a specific set of things so i, I found that one very interesting as well uh just because usually you see the delete all as opposed to delete your accounts delete your asset accounts delete your expense accounts so a little bit different but uh it's a cool feature um and then the last thing i wanted to touch on uh really was the currencies uh and this one Obviously, I, I don't know if the developers are European. Uh, by default, it actually shows up in euros. 
So your uh, instance when it's deployed is set in euros. So unfortunately, you, I went to create a transaction the first time and I tried to switch the currency to US dollar because we're, you know, we're based out of the US. So I just, I'm not transacting in euros. Sure enough, it's blocked, it's locked. So you can't go in and create an account, you can't create a transaction in US dollar. You have to actually go into the currencies page, set your, you, you have to enable it, uh, enable the US dollar and then set it as a default, um, which is pretty cool. And then the other thing I saw out there, uh, here's your crypto plug, Bitcoin Cash is out there. So Not- something interesting to see. Yeah, it's it. I didn't see Bitcoin, but Bitcoin Cash is <laughs> implemented as a, uh, a currency yeah, not, on Firefly 3. Not only is it implemented in Firefly 3, it's also the second option right below the Australian dollar and the Brazilian hey And <laughs> I, I was just, I, I, I did see that when I was deploying and I was like, that is so cool. That is so cool, right? So you can track you can track your Bitcoin Cash transactions. I'm gonna have to reach yeah. out to see why, because that's that's not like usual. That's not like typical. That's not like no. a, a crypto outsider. Oh, I just want to put in something default. Oh, let me just default to Bitcoin Cash. It's like no, you you thought that through for some reason. Let, let me default to Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> yeah, honestly, <laughs> but. That's all I have for the other interfaces. Um, the big one we covered was classification. Obviously, categories and tags are important. Mm-hmm. Reports. You're, everyone loves a good chart, so I'd highly recommend uh, checking those out at least you know once a quarter. It's nice to look at that kind of stuff. Um, and then obviously you have all your options. If finances are pretty serious, uh, and I would just encourage this on all services, but two-step verification, it, it's easy to set up. There's no reason it shouldn't be set up for a service like this, um, especially if your password is, you know, say Hunter 2. It, it's something that can really protect you. It, it's that something you have, right? Um, something you know, something you have. So uh, that, that'll keep your account secure. But that is all I have for the other application interfaces. I, if you have any questions, um, reach out on rcompose.com, reach out on rcompose.com. Um, we're always available to answer any questions that you guys have. And to wrap up this episode, I'm going to play an interview that I had done, uh, about a week ago. Uh, so I am going to let past Andrew, uh, introduce you and, uh, take you through the rest of the episode. Hey, everybody. Recently, I sat down with Jared Kirk to go over his Salesforce implementation. We went over how he happened into his job as a Salesforce administrator, what it takes to be successful in creating systems that work to actually help people, and two tenets of successful automation tools. I really enjoyed my time talking with him. And so without further ado, here's Jared Kirk. Uh, I'd like to start out, though, just kind of going through your history. Okay, sure. Wow. Uh, homework. So, gosh, I right out of high school knew I wanted to go into the ministry, which you can tell I'm not in now. So uh, I actually went to Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri for like three years. Um, and, and I ran out of time and motivation, uh, or excuse me, not time, I'm money and motivation <laughs> Uh, and so I ended up leaving after three years there, uh, and just worked for a while, got married, uh, had a kid. Um, and for the first several months uh, of, of being married, I was in, you know, part-time or not part-time jobs, you know, just one-off jobs, things that were not, um, not careers. Mm. Uh, one of them, I worked at like a rent to own place. So I mean, just super, uh, non impressive background in all honesty. I remember being on the back porch of my father-in-law's house that he owned, uh, and was going to rent out to people, but he let us live there so that we would be the, the landlords of a few other properties. I was on the back porch of a house that wasn't mine, uh, having been fired from yet another job. And I was, just praying, God, you have to provide for my family because I clearly can't. Um, and within about two weeks, I got a call from uh, this company who I had some some ties with. 
um, loose ties though they were. Uh, and it's a very niche company. We work with um, bleachers, athletic equipment, anything in a gymnasium. And I knew nothing about any of that. I mean, if I ask you, what do you know about uh, about bleachers? I, I sit on them occasionally. That's that's about it. That's what, that's what everybody <laughs> says, and that's where I started. Um, and it's been I've been there for seven and a half years now, and I've worked my way up from um, basically being a secretary for the uh, service manager um, to doing a majority of the quoting for our service department. Um, I have. Um, brought us over. When I first started, we had like three different systems that we worked out of. Um, and this, I think, kind of starts leading into some of what you were wanting to talk about. Um, we had three different systems. We had something called Blue Folder, which was awful. Um, we had Salesforce, which we didn't really use, to be honest. Um, and then we had um, my favorite system was this really tall set of filing cabinets. Um, with just so many folders stuffed with paper. Um, and it was just, it was a nightmare. Um, really, it was to look anything up. There was no true organizational system in place. Um, I'm, I'm a somewhat organized person by nature. So that bothered me to my very core. And um, I, I set about trying to uh, make some changes to that. And that's kind of how we got started in Salesforce. So do you want to do you want to talk more on like what what you came into and like what irked you like why why did you why did you feel like that wasn't working for you uh, the organizational s- yeah. system yeah um just because when you've got the multiple systems you are entering the same information multiple times otherwise you don't have consistent records and if somebody else who is also working on that project or that job uh, is going to answer a question for a customer or try to get more information on it, or if you hand it off to someone else and they look in the wrong place, they may have outdated information or, or mm. just incorrect mm-hmm. information. Some of it was organized by date. Some of it was, or, was organized by um, internal job number. But then you have to ask which internal job number because we had multiple sets of internal job numbers. Um, it was just it was just difficult. And that, that for me was very difficult. Um, and it's difficult to train someone Um, I think I was the first new hire at this company in, I want to say nine years at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so training me was not something that had been really considered. One of the, one of the first projects that I sort of took on and and, and tried to make my own was um, to find a set of standards um, and sort of map out what the flow of any given job might be. And the, the thing that was always thrown was, well, well, everything's custom. Yeah, yeah, okay, sure. But also everything follows a, a sort of a, a generic pattern. Um, so find those patterns that the custom things can work inside of. Um, and, and so I, I made a, a flow chart of, of how that worked. And it's, it's evolved a lot since then. But um, that was sort of the start um, because I was able to data driven show here is sort of the choke point where everything is getting stuck at. This is what we need to address. Like if, if we're looking at updating a system, this is what we need to deal with. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you presented this, did you have any like suggestions or, or, or is this something that, that kind of bubbled up your, your, your feelings and, and, and your ideas about this kind of workflow? Um, I didn't, know what I was getting into at first, honestly. Um, I could point out, okay, here's the problem. Um, and, and the solution, generically speaking, was, hey, we, we have a lot of data entry. We have a lot of um, information that, that's really not aligned. Um, it would make a lot of sense to get out of all of these systems and either pick one that we've got uh, or um, choose a new one. You know, it was just something that we can do everything we need to inside of. I mean, at the time, again, we used Salesforce, but it was just to, gosh, it was just to keep track of, like, generically speaking, I spoke to a person. Generically speaking, we did a quote for them. What was that quote? Mm. Can't, can't tell you. Who'd you send it to? Not sure. When did it happen? Great question, you know. Uh, <laughs> 
There was a lot of that. I don't know what I'm doing. So the president of the company comes to the meeting where I'm kind of showing everybody that, hey, this is this is what I've observed. Um, president of our company has always been very um, open to people taking initiative, um, which, mm-hmm. which has been great. And so he said, okay, great. Fix it. P- pardon? Pardon? He said, yeah. Uh, you know, you want to go to one system? Great. Find the system. We'll, we'll do that. Oh my gosh. You know, that's, that's a, that's a huge thing for somebody who had no idea what he was doing. Um, and so, you know, I, I started doing as much research as I could, um, asking the questions that I, um, that I knew to ask. Um, and we landed on Salesforce, um, being something that we weren't fully utilizing and could utilize better. Um, and then if we upgraded one level, we had all of this opportunity to sort of build our own system. On, mm-hmm. Like in Salesforce, we ended up spending, I think, like twenty thousand dollars to hire mm-hmm. a, a third-party company to come in and help us just build out what we were looking for. And how it is with all situations like that, they get you about seventy-five to eighty percent of the way to what you want, and then you don't know the right questions to ask, or you don't know the mm-hmm. problems that you're about to encounter. And you say, "That looks great." Thanks. And then they leave and want to charge a lot to come back. So you just kind of have to figure it out as you go. I kind of like peered over their shoulders as much as I could to see what they were doing and how they were doing it. I um, kind of how the pieces connected. Um, and so to get in and, and sort of manipulate it was, you know, my first, first thing I had to figure out. Um, and then from there, um, what I have really enjoyed has been um, Salesforce has some really powerful automation tools um, I think that any sort of platform needs automation tools and they need to be broad, um, like large in scope, but simple in execution. Like they, they need to be simple to, to understand, uh, to operate. Um, so that, that, that was a bit of a learning curve, but no, I, I've, I've done probably five and a half, six years now of being sort of our Salesforce administrator and and utilizing a lot of those backend tools. And actually the same thing that we paid that company $20,000 for, that was just for our service department. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a whole other side of our company that doesn't use Salesforce right now, at least not the way that they could. And they're experiencing the exact same pain points that the service side did six and a half, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I am going to very shortly here be, um, developing all of that myself. We're not going to hire that company. I'm going to do that because I now have the, I now have the skills, uh, the Google search ability to be able to do these things. Um, and I'm actually really, really excited about it. Like it's weird. Um, but like sometimes I'm just sitting on my own. I'm like, yeah, I I can, that, that can connect here. (laughs) And that's, so I'm, it's, it's the weirdest thing. Like in my free time, why am I thinking about this? Um, it's just because I enjoy, uh, mm. te- I enjoy technology. I enjoy sort of the challenge, uh, that's associated with it. And I, I really, at my core, I love organization and, um, efficiency. And so if there's the ability to make it work more efficiently, like I'm, I'm in, I am sold. Let's make it happen. Now, that that efficiency has to actually solve a, a a pain point. Oh, absolutely, yes. So it, you said that you know you've you've kind of gone through those you know as you've uh, implemented this and and now the the other side of your business is is kind of encountering that. Um, what was one of your successes? Like what your your early on um like a like a light bulb moment to the company mm-hmm. where they're like, hey, this could actually come to fruition. Sure. Um, I think the first time that people were like. Oh, that's why we're doing all of this um, was when we imported all of the information that we had in the old systems and put mm-hmm. all of it in one place. Um, there is the ability to run reports in most CRMs and mm-hmm. to be able to run a report on all of the various uh, service requests that we had done to that point to be able to segment them by years or by months or by weeks or by fiscal quarters. 
um, and by, you know, was it a service call or was it something that we quoted first? It was just we're like, oh, wow, like that's, that's actually really useful. So that's where our money is going. Oh, my mm-hmm. gosh. You know, um, that yes. was, I think, the moment that it occurred to everybody else that this isn't a terrible idea and we should probably put the information in. Good information in, good information out. Absolutely. Very valuable lesson. A very important um, way that I try to look at it, and I'm not always successful, but I really do try and I advise others as well, is don't walk in and just say, well, that needs to change and that needs to change. And all, this all needs to change because um, to do that is foolhardy and, and really genuinely undermining the, the, the time and effort and years in some cases that people have put into what's happening right now. What's happening today is a result of the culmination of years of, at that time, innovation um, and, and organization. So to really solve any problem, you have to first understand why it's landed where it has. And to, to continue that conversation, I think what you're talking about is uh, the the culture, right? You know, mm-hmm. you you have all this weight of all the years that that's come up, and and the way people are used to working together and working with what they have, um, mm-hmm. and 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 you have this culture that has evolved out of that. Um, now, when you implement a type of system like that, when when you're when you're changing the way people work, you're in essence changing their culture, and and a lot of people mm-hmm. are opposed to that, right? Absolutely. So, like. What did you run into or, or what did you take away from having gone through that culture change with your, with your company? Um, you've heard the adage, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, I find that that is not entirely true, actually. Um, there's one of two things that will get that old dog to learn a new trick. Mm-hmm. It's either a treat, or forgive me, but a beating. It'll learn. Um, you know, there were some people who were interested in the uh, improvements that they saw were possible, and were interested in um, sort of falling in line with not just. At first, it was just well, that's Jared's system. Well, no, like this, this is intended to be a company system, something that we're all doing together. Um, we did have one holdout. Uh, I told you we've been in Salesforce like hardcore for like five and a half, six years. Uh, there's one gentleman who just had a conversation with the president of the company about three months ago where the president said, you will do this. You must do this. And it was, um, it was a little bit difficult. And, and, and I hope mm-hmm. to address that um, by specifically meeting the needs of, of the individuals from the get-go. Um, are there any other questions uh, that you think that I didn't ask? One of the, Actually, something that happened here recently is I'm in and fiddling with, we, we got some people moving around and, and, and switching to different roles in a company. And mm-hmm. so, of course, there are um, there's a lot of moving pieces there. And here recently, I've had like two or three occasions where somebody will come at me just guns blazing because a thing didn't operate the way that they expected it to. Mm. Listen, mm-hmm. that's totally reasonable, but um, let me look into it. And of course, um, whenever one of the automations fails, it sends uh, an email notification to me because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the Salesforce admin, it sends an email notification to me telling me what happened, how it happened, why it happened, when it happened, who did it. Um, and so I was actually on the road to come back to the home office here. Um, this was Tuesday and, uh, I got about 17 emails just in a row. Um, and I'm thinking, Oh, something just went terribly wrong. And I literally pulled over and I, I started looking at my phone because I'm like, I, I've got to figure this. Out. It was one person trying to do one thing and they just kept hitting the button. Um, and so, so I, um, I actually called him in that moment. He said, well, how'd you know that? I said, well, listen, man, I, uh, Salesforce admin powers. I, uh, I'm, in tune, I'm in tune with it. Um, so that, that's always fun to surprise people with that. But yeah, no, that's part of the challenge. I love it. Actually, one of the, one of the things I did want to hit on now that you bring up that automation again, mm-hmm. um, 
You, you had a really good point about automation tools needing to be, uh, twofold, right? Needing to, to have a, a large scope, right? To be mm-hmm. able to do a lot of things and touch a lot of things and also to be simple. Um, I, I was wondering if you can expand on that because those are two really good points. Um, I, I just don't know how personally that has manifested, uh, with, sure. with you and Salesforce. Um, I, I personally believe that if there is a field or if there is anything in the system, it needs to be able to be touched by automation. Mm. Um, otherwise, you are limiting the user. But no, it, it needs to be able to touch on everything. That's what I mean by broad. Like if this updates, if it changes, if it updates because this happened or that happened, um, it, it just needs to be able to touch everything. And it needs to be um, user friendly. You know, if somebody gets in and they're like, Ah, uh, uh, I have no idea. This is just so mass, and it's 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 scary, and and you know it's it's it limits people's desire to interact with it. Mm. Um, and if I'm honest, that's how I was at first with it. But I'm I, I was bound and determined I was going to figure it out because I I want to be able to solve these problems. You know, yep. um, I'm I'm a problem solver and task motivated. So, um. But it, it needs to have um, a simplicity to it, whether that's a consistent uh, user interface um, or just making language obvious um, is also very important. If you, if you throw in a few technical terms, you will obfuscate that information for a huge number of people. Um, it's one of those things you don't know it unless you know it. And if you know it, which is, you know, all the developers of Salesforce, well, it makes total sense, you know, Um not always. I and mean, that's something I've had to learn on our end too, you know? So making it simple is the absolute best word that I have for that. Um, if that, if that helps answer that question. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was really happy to, to be able to sit down with you today. Can't wait to see what comes next. Uh, Cause that sounds exciting as well. Oh, you and me both. <laughs> and with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Arkham Postcast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you on in two weeks. Bye, everybody.